Welcome back to A Case for Cannabis. My name is Alfredo Matthew, founder of Working World LLC, and I'm very excited to be here with Nicole Elliott, the director of California Cannabis Control. Did I say that right? Department of department. Cannabis Control. We are officially a department now. Officially a department in the state of California. Nicole, such a pleasure to Thank see you. you today. It's a pleasure to be here. So we were just talking, when you were born, did you know you wanted to be the director of this department? <laughs> I did not, no, no. When I was born, it was in the 80s, so the height of the drug war. So no, cannabis was not, did not have a department in the state of California to license and regulate it. Not there. How did you meander your way to find here? And, and you also just shared that you came through the community college system. I did, yes. I started at Chico. I moved to Sierra College, and I finished at the University of San Francisco. Cool. Uh, so I meandered my way to San Francisco. I uh, started working for government, local government in San Francisco. Uh, and after the passage of Prop 64, was tasked with project managing the regulatory framework and office development in San Francisco for uh, adult use and medical cannabis. For those of us who don't know the storied history of regulation in the cannabis industry in California, you said Prop 64? Yes. Like, when did cannabis first become legal? So medical cannabis became legal in 1996 in California. Proposition 64 uh, decriminalized uh, cannabis activity and made adult use uh, cannabis legal. Okay. And then after Proposition 64, the state legislature created a regulatory framework that combined medical and adult use cannabis into one. And that framework is what we have been iterating, if you will, ever since. Okay. Uh, and is ultimately what led to the creation of the department. Okay. And that, and when you say adult usage, is that the recreational mm -hmm. usage? And is yes. that like. We like to say adult use okay. because we want to make clear it's for adults. Yes. And that was more like 2015, 16? Proposition uh, 64 passed in 2016. Okay. And then commercial cannabis activity for adult use cannabis came online in January 2018. 2018. This, right, it's very hard for someone who isn't following all of the updates, right? Like what's legal, what's not legal, you know, how are things changing? I imagine it's challenging for business owners who are entering into the field to kind of navigate this regulatory environment. Like what, what, what has it been like? What, like? what have you seen first in San Francisco, which is a leader in the state, how did you help prepare folks to enter into the industry? Well, I'll say it's a it's a fluid space. It does, from a policy standpoint, evolve pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely right. And it's challenging for a lot of our stakeholders. It's challenging for local governments. It's challenging for businesses. Um, it's it's challenging for a number of consumers to, yeah. to track what's legal and what's not legal. Um, so uh, I empathize with that in large part because I was a local regulator as the state was evolving its policies very rapidly. Um, so to my time in San Francisco, uh, I spent a lot of time with our operators, uh, hearing from them. Uh, a, a large number of these operators were not licensed. They were not technically legal. Yeah. Uh, they were operating in a, a gray space and um, one of the highlights of my time in San Francisco was running uh, the amnesty program there. And that was working directly with operators, hearing directly from operators what they needed to be successful and creating a program that ultimately met that objective because that was a shared objective the city and county of San Francisco had with those operators was to ensure that they were successful in becoming legal, well-regulated legitimate businesses in the, in the jurisdiction. Because that's what the industry needs in order to mature and Correct. to develop. You can't have, right, I, I hear a lot, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people in the past year, one third of the state, it's, you know, it's legal, it's operating, you know, two thirds of the state currently don't have, you know, access because of local jurisdiction. And it, the illicit market, the informal market makes it hard for the formal market. And it's kind of a difficult dance, but are you seeing that progress is being made 
to kind of support folks entering into the the formal market, like through this amnesty program and other things that that you're rolling out? So the amnesty program is something that really is most successful on a a local level, and it takes an enormous amount of political will uh, and direction uh, Mm. to make an amnesty program work. And the city and county of San Francisco was unique in that it has a very strong mayor system and all members of the board and departments agreed uh, with the overall objectives and were willing to sort of bend bureaucracy a bit Mm -hmm. to make it successful. That's very hard to accomplish in jurisdictions across the state, Uh, but it is something that from my vantage point, I think the state wants to be supportive of uh, local jurisdictions doing those types of transitions because ultimately, uh, to your data point, um, there are a significant number of jurisdictions that have yet to provide pathways to Mm -hmm. end prohibition in their jurisdiction and create legitimate pathways for their businesses to operate legally and for their consumers to access uh, legal cannabis, legal tested safe cannabis. Yeah. Um, One thing I think is really important about the department, a role the department can play is inserting uh, more uh, statistics and facts in this conversation. And so one thing I do want to correct is that there are about 62% of jurisdictions that don't provide uh, legal pathways to retail in particular in the state of California. And that represents about one third of our population. So there are dense jurisdictions that have provided pathways to legitimate uh, retail opportunities in particular, access opportunities for their consumers. There are a lot of smaller jurisdictions or more rural jurisdictions Mm -hmm. that haven't yet, that don't perhaps have the resources, uh, the political will, um, or the support necessary to do that, and the department's here to help them. Yeah, California is a huge state. (laughs) It's hard to get everyone on the same page. Um, Not easy. And I'm just curious, like, how does the government work? Because this is not all up to you. You don't manage every aspect of this, the taxation and everything else. Like, can you just help us understand, like, how many different departments are involved with this industry? Uh, more than I have an exact number for. Uh, but <laughs> there's a significant number of, I mean, I, from my time on the local level, there's plenty of local departments uh, that are engaging in this space. But on the state level... It depends on the type of activity you're doing, but ultimately uh, the Department of of Cannabis Control is just one department you're engaging with. Uh, You're paying taxes, so you're engaging Mm -hmm. with our Department of Tax and Fee Administration. If you're a cultivator, uh, you're engaging uh, significantly with our Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Water Board. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a lot of crossover with state departments, and we have good relationships with all of them, and that's ultimately... Um, an exercise in trying to make this an easier process for our businesses that are engaging um, in licensure, getting licensure, staying in licensure. Um. And what I'm loving about meeting cannabis operators, it's not one sector of the economy. It's cultivation, it's manufacturing, it's distribution, it's retail, it's data and testing and laboratories and technology and really like the industry is nascent it's small now compared to what it might be what what it will become in the years to come is that something that you're excited about like I mean what paint a little picture of like what could the future of this industry be for California for you know I mean this this thing could really grow yeah well California is uh, the breadbasket of, of the US I think is a common saying yeah um, and this is one of, of many um, products that come from our agricultural community we're also uh, home to amazing entrepreneurs mm-hmm. um, a lot of innovation and you see that in the product development in the marketing and advertising um, of these products. Um, and so ultimately California, I mean, California has been the largest market and will be the largest market, at mm-hmm. least in the U S if not the world, uh, for the foreseeable future. So long as we're able to create pathways across the United States to support our production capacity in the state of California, which is more 
than our consumption capacity historically. Ooh, so you mean like interstate commerce? Correct. So that's the that's the big. I mean, right? The food in California feeds the country. The cannabis in California can provide that to the country. Historically, it has. California has a reputation. Our cannabis is well known across the country. Um, now it shouldn't be going across our borders, technically, yes. under the current construct. Uh, but we know that the state of California, that, that within the state of California, there is more production than capacity to consume. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. is something that, you know, is well documented even in state in state analyses. Yeah. So. And, and it's hurting cultivators, right? Like right now, I mean, just I've, I've heard a little bit from folks who, I mean, right, we, because we don't have good data, because there isn't, you know, it's really good market conditions. People don't know how much they should be producing, right? Yep. Uh, I mean, that is just very frustrating, I'm sure, for the business owners. Absolutely. Yes, there's a lot that can be done to address that. There's a lot that can be done uh, by the state. The state's trying to do more around sharing our data related to production capacity so that businesses can better plan for agricultural cycles. Yeah. Uh, however, it for those there will for those producers that are already uh, producing in the legal market, um, even they are having challenges with oversupply and not enough access points in the state of California. So there's more to do on retail access. In California, but there's also plenty of production for outside of the state. A big part of that is just destigmatizing mm -hmm. cannabis, because right, I'm a kid of the '80s and like war on drugs, right? Everything that I was told, what my family, you know, told me, right? And yeah. it's like I still have, you know, I'm like I'm, you know, I'm a professional adult. I'm doing this series, a case for cannabis, and some people, right, who know my background, I'm an educator, I'm an entrepreneur. Why are you doing that? You know, why are you doing this cannabis thing? And I'm like, I believe in entrepreneurs. I believe in this pathway. I'm excited that the community colleges are trying to destigmatize it and embrace it because how beneficial is this going to be for people who want to work in the industry, for people who want to start businesses, for this indigenous industry to California? If it becomes more accepted, how much of, is destigmatization part of growing the, the industry? I think it's huge, right? I think it's huge. I think so. Two things. One, I think destigmatizing, normalizing this is important uh, because we know people have consumed for generations, for decades, regardless of uh, you know narcotics law. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to learn from uh, previous industries. So think of alcohol industry, tobacco industry. We have an opportunity to take lessons learned from regulating those industries and apply, you know, smart practices in when it comes to cannabis. I like to think of um, advertising as an example. We know that there are um, challenges associated with youth exposure uh, in cannabis, and that's a, a hot button issue. Mm -hmm. Advertising in cannabis is a hot button issue. So let's learn from uh, previous industries and think about how we can do it right when it comes to cannabis, because it hasn't historically been done right when it comes to um, other industries. But that's all part of the normalization process is going through those exercises and trying to figure out what will work best for our communities, for California society, for California children, for California communities more broadly. Um, so that's something that is exciting about the work that we get to do here in the Department of Cannabis Control. We get to challenge assumptions and think about what should be best practices in this space um, and help communities, people uh, better understand how this plant can integrate into their world in a way that's thoughtful and safe and well-regulated. Yeah. Because... I don't know what percentage of folks are using cannabis, but it's teachers, it's doctors, it's nurses, it's your person next door. It's, you know, my mother-in-law who has arthritis, who, you know, needs a topical. It's, it's, there's so many, it's so many diverse things that can be done with the plant. What I'm hearing is we don't even know all of the uses that, we don't. that can come from this and all of the potential benefits. Um, so why is it, important for higher education 
to start to embrace this, right? I, I've interviewed two college presidents, uh, President Chong, Santa Rosa Junior College, Shown Farms. They have like a hemp and, you know, a, an amazing program. Merritt College, President Johnson. Community colleges are starting to get involved. Is that a good thing, in your opinion? It's a great thing. It's absolutely a great thing. Um, you know, when I think about higher education getting involved, I think about how far behind we are as a society in our understanding of this plant and really how inexcusable that is because it's it's because of, you know, policies of the past now in California that have prevented that type of research, that type of education, those important discussions from happening. So there's a lot of catch up to do. Yeah. So it's really, it's, it's wonderful to see community colleges getting so involved. Um, I also think helping generations understand, future generations understand, you know, where, where we went wrong Mm. on policing, right? For, for instance, over policing of black and brown communities Um, The historical context of this plant, the racist historical context of uh, some of our policies on the federal, state, and local levels, I think is really important for people to understand so that we don't repeat those in future instances and so that we start to create policies that think about how we rebuild from some of that destruction. Yeah. I mean, today, California for All, the equity initiatives... You compare that to the 80s, right, to, to the mass incarceration, to the over-policing, to the stigmatization. I mm-hmm. mean, right, so California is really trying to make things right, but there's a lot of mistrust. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of, lot of things to overcome. Um, with community college, like why I love community colleges, right, they're the equity engine of, right, 2.1 million students mainly black and brown students in these schools, got to be pathways. Mm -hmm. What are some of the pathways in this industry that young people should be thinking about or people who are working in other industries, but they're not happy in those industries, right? The great raises nation, people are looking for purpose. Why cannabis? Well, I think, you know, in in the cannabis space, I'm I'm not in the industry, so it's hard to speak for the industry, but I, I think there's a lot of potential within cannabis, within the immediate plant touching industry um, mm-hmm. to take part in, you know, something really incredible. This is a massive social experiment. It's a very important one. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be sort of the heartbeat of that within the industry is an exceptional opportunity. I'll speak for myself in saying on the government side, uh, there's also a lot of really incredible opportunity. We're helping to shape, you know, this experiment and ultimately the outcomes of this experiment. Um, and, and so I would say you have the industry, you have ancillary to the industry, which there's a lot of consultants, lawyers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, accountants, I mean, everything. environment, yeah, CEQA people, like there's just a ton of uh, ancillary opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity in the space in which I work in government. Um, ultimately, it's a really exciting time because very rarely do we have the opportunity to take an entire industry and bring it into the light and do so in a really thoughtful way, in a way that that centers uh, social justice as a part of that exercise. And I don't know if we're going to have many opportunities uh, uh, like this ahead. So it's a really, really awesome moment in time um, to to join this, as I said, this massive social experiment and be really solutions driven and and try to create something that's going to work for, again, for you, for your communities, for the state of California, and ultimately, when the U.S. gets around to it, the United States. As goes California, as goes goes the nation, Mm -hmm. as goes San Francisco, so goes California. (laughs) So I mean, I'm biased, but I agree. I'm a New Yorker, so (laughs) it takes a lot for me to say that, because I was raised, as goes New New York, center of the universe. Not this time, yeah. But I'm a believer in the Bay Area. I'm a believer in California because of the innovation and the culture here and the open-mindedness and the willingness to do things differently and do things better. Mm -hmm. And, right, it does move across the country. We've seen that with legalization state by state. And it will happen. But I've also heard that the country isn't ready for full legalization because we haven't worked everything out, Mm -hmm. especially with the 
the transition from the legacy economy to the formal economy. Like, there's things we have to get right before it can go prime time. Um, with community colleges, with workforce, with government, there's opportunity. You said that there's opportunities. Are you hiring in yes. the next six months? Absolutely. We have over 200 positions we're hiring into over the coming year, two years. Uh, so there's a ton of positions across our licensing division, our compliance division, our enforcement division, our lab division. If people have lived experience in cannabis. Even better. So you can we have to be careful of conflicts of interest. Yes. Uh, but for those people who understand the culture, the community, the plant, that's always super informative uh, to our work. So that is really cool. So f there's opportunities for people to use their skill sets that they've developed in compliance, in regulation, in local government. I mean, Absolutely. there's there's sky's the limit where yeah. people can go. Yep. Cool. Ending, what is your, like, hope for the future? What is something that you would be really excited about in the next few years, right? Not about COVID. <laughs> Forget <laughs> about COVID. Like, COVID goes away. I'm thinking specific to yeah, cannabis. Specific okay. to cannabis. <laughs> um, what would be uh, the most exciting thing in the next couple of years uh, is to see a department that's fully built out, very stable, um, thriving, and ultimately creating a stable, sustainable, equitable legal market in the state of California that everybody can look to and say, this is the shining example of what we want in our states uh, in the years to come. You heard it here. Nicole Elliott, California, the shining example of the states in the years to come. Let's hope it comes to fruition. Thank you so much for Thank your you. time. Thanks for having me. All right.